ready? Okay, we'll get started then. Um, Long-term care survey process, considerations for the dietitian. A lot of you have done or will be doing your uh, clinical, part of your clinical experience in long-term care, and some of you had to actually not be there during survey, so you may not have experienced the joy that is the survey process. To start with, um, the survey process is um, a federally mandated um, process that you have to go through and these federal tags or F tags are the federal standards of care that all long-term care centers must meet. Long-term care centers are surveyed on these standards every 9 to 15 months. So depending upon where you fall or how your survey went the time before is whether or not you're on a 9-month survey cycle or a 15-month survey cycle. With all surveys in the uh, all long-term care centers in the country need to be surveyed uh, within 12 months, an average of 12 months. So if you had a very good survey the time before, you may go out to the 15 months, and if your survey wasn't so great the time before, it may be more like nine months. The uh, each each um, time they come is is based upon not only the, the case mix of your clients at that point, but also based on your results from the year before. So some of the surveys, uh, the tags that would be uh, applicable to you as a dietitian would be, first of all, F325, which is nutrition parameters. This is the way the tag reads, based on a resident's comprehensive assessment, the facility must ensure that a resident, one, maintains acceptable parameters of nutritional status, such as body weight and protein levels, unless the resident's clinical condition demonstrates that this is not possible, and to receive a therapeutic diet when there is a nutritional problem. So as a dietitian, you need to be sure that you are monitoring these nutrition parameters appropriately. Unfortunately, the F tag still includes protein levels. We all know that uh, serum protein levels are not really a, an indication of nutritional status. Unfortunately, that hasn't translated all the way up to the, through the federal government yet. So you do have to address serum protein levels in your notes. Albumin to prealbumin, transparent if you have them, have to be addressed. Normally what I would do would say albumin is you know, 2.8. This is not an indicator of nutritional status, but instead an indicator of inflammation or chronic disease, whatever the case may be because you still have to address it according to the federal tag. <coughs> Body weights have to be monitored at least monthly. If there is a significant change in weight, then it needs to be monitored more than that. The, um, I was gonna ask you a question, but since I can't, I won't. Um, as far as, as body weight goes, the, um, the standard is 5% weight loss in one month. 7.5% weight loss in three months, or 10% weight loss in six months. So these need to be monitored. Most of the online programs, the uh, electronic medical records that are web-based, will generate reports for you, so you don't have to actually calculate it yourself. If you're in a building that doesn't have an electronic medical record, then you need to have a system in place as a dietitian to keep track of all these weights and to make sure that you're charting on weights that need to be charted on. The, uh, the other thing that's important about maintaining weights is that you have a relationship with somebody who's doing the weights. It's best that one person weighs in each building for the sake of consistency. If that's not happening as a dietitian, you should probably try to see to it that it can happen. This can be harder for consultant dietitians who are only in the building one day a week or two days a week. I was, I had it really pretty good because I was the food service director and the dietitian, I was 40 hours a week in one building, so if there was a problem, it was easier for me to address it with the director of nursing. So again, the RDRDN must evaluate residents for significant weight changes, nutrition-related laboratory results, medication-food interactions, risk of pressure ulcers, and the need for a nutrition care plan that's based on the nutrition care process. So we talked about some nutrition-related lab results. Um, some other lab results that you may need to look at 
closely, um, even though they may not be nutrition related, they are related to nutrition. For example, like glucose levels, hemoglobin A1Cs, things like that need to be evaluated by you and the state will expect you to have evaluated. If there's a problem with an A1C being very high and you haven't addressed it with the resident, then you're responsible for it. It's really important that, you know, and we've talked about this before, even if you recommend something and the, the, either the resident doesn't want to follow an, a, 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 a controlled carbohydrate diet or the doctor doesn't want to order a controlled carbohydrate diet, you need to document that as, as politically correct as possible. You need to document that you have addressed this either with a physician or with a resident and it was declined because otherwise you're held responsible for it and you will get a tag that's F3 F325. And I hope none of you ever get that tag. I mean, I, thankfully I never had that tag at all. So if you keep up with your charting and your charting is, um, is inclusive and accurate, then you shouldn't have any problem with this tag. It, you're not expected to keep people from having poor nutritional status necessarily. I mean, you, if you've shown to have done all you can possibly do, have you worked with the patient on, on his or her food preferences? Have you discussed any problems with related disciplines? If you've done all that and still the patient won't eat, then, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. There, unfortunately, there is no magic pill that will make somebody eat or, you know, maintain their weight. So but you have to show that you've done everything you can. And you need to make sure you use the nutrition care process. Interestingly enough, I just found this out. Uh, many of you know the model that I worked under for a long time, at least while I've been here anyway. When I was working part-time still at the nursing home, I, had, uh, I, I was a consultant there eight hours a week, and I had two dietetics who covered the building for the day-to-day -day stuff. However, um, apparently the standards of practice for the DTR have changed as of June because in South Florida there was a citation given for a dietetic using the nutrition care process. This has huge ramifications for uh, places like um, Nutritious Lifestyle, HCSG in our area that hire and that use or like me use a, a DTR in, you, you know, to chart and use the nutrition care process. They're really not allowed to do that anymore. So there are going to be more dietitians, and there's going to be more of a need for you as dietitians to be in the building because they're not going to be able to do that anymore. So, and that's that just no one knew that the standards of practice changed. If you look it up under the academy website, quality management, you will see the standards of practice for the DTR and the RDN, and that's going to be huge. Okay, uh, as far as F325, also the RDRDN must closely monitor residents who receive nutrition support via tube feedings or TPN, have pressure ulcers, and receive dialysis. You must regularly c communicate with the dialysis RDN and document that in the chart. So you need to have labs from dialysis, you need to document that you've talked to the dialysis dietitian, and that you're on the same page. Now, dialysis RDs um, are mandated by the federal government for their patients to have an albumin of 4.0, which is nearly impossible considering the inflammatory nature of end-stage uh, renal disease. And so it's really important that you document together what you're doing um, to help that patient because she needs to document it in her notes when she has her Medicare visits. You need to have it documented in your notes too. Most people do on dialysis get a protein supplement um, just because of that. They get ProStat or something like that twice or three times a day just to show that they need more. And, you know, and, and we all know that if you're going, if you're an end stage renal disease and you're on hemodialysis, your protein needs are higher than an end stage dialysis patient who's not yet on hemodialysis. So um, it's really okay. And, and also, you have. Um, a lot of these high-risk high patients have concomitant problems. So if you have a diabetic who is on dialysis, who's had a leg amputation, who has a pressure ulcer, you know, there are probably a myriad of reasons why they need that extra protein anyway. 
So it is important that you have all of that documented. Again, um, pressure ulcers are very important, are just as important as the weight. You should all be participating in some kind of a risk committee uh, where you discuss the patients who have, are having um, weight problems, pressure ulcer problems, and other issues together. And then you would be with nursing, therapy, social work, maybe even the pharmacist from time to time would be in that committee meeting. Now those committee meetings, when state walks in the door, are proprietary. You don't, you are not supposed to give out any minutes or anything like that. And just as a, as a caveat, if anyone, if a state surveyor ever asks you for documentation, like, oh, I'd like to see your list of pressure ulcers or your list of patients with significant weight loss, you don't give it to them. You may be, be in, uncomfortable saying that, so you can just say, well, I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. That's always something really good to have in your vocabulary. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. But that's proprietary information. Any minutes from those meetings or anything like that is proprietary information. Now you can give them a list of, um, what I would say if a surveyor asked me that, I would say is, um, can I give you a list of five people with significant weight loss that I recently charted on? And then they will usually say okay, because they know they're not supposed to ask you for your complete list but they will try. So you need to just always keep that in mind. Um, it, it's not for them to look at. It's all um, considered protected under your quality improvement program. And they already have a list anyway. They, uh, because of uh, the MDS, the minimum data set, which is the assessment that all, all of you have to do, all disciplines have to do in long-term care, that MDS is submitted electronically to the government and it actually, they, they come with a list of patients who have had significant weight loss, who have, had, who have pressure ulcers, they already know everything about everybody. So they're just trying to, add, to make their job a little easier by not having to delve into it and get a new report. Does anybody have any questions about F325 and the kind of responsibilities you as a dietitian have under F325? All right, F371, I'll go ahead, Julia. Okay, so um, being that I have with the dietetic technician and things like that, so the nu nutrition care process, they're not able to basically document the way yeah. that they were able to. So then what is it, the RD having to come back and document, they're gathering all the information for the registered dietitian? Yes, they can do an effect, like a, a screening form and okay. gather the information and then you can, as the RD, enter it into the into the nutrition care process, whatever system that you use, whether it's the EMR or in writing. Unfortunately, this information hasn't gotten out to everybody yet, so, you know, I wouldn't call your DTRs and tell them this <laughs> great information right now. But um, I, it, it's filtering out because uh, the survey team in South Florida is citing uh, that DTRs and RDs under F325 for not using the appropriate um, personnel to to chart. So um, that's going to be mean more jobs for dietitians, and that's going to mean DTRs um, are going to be doing more kitchen in, in our management stuff, or they need to come here <coughs> and do their RD. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, F-371 is the most cited F-tag in the country. Storage, preparation, distribution, and serving food under sanitary conditions. The facility must procure food from sources approved or considered satisfactory from federal, state, or local authorities and store, prepare, and distribute and serve food under sanitary conditions. And of course we do want to do that, don't we? And I can't say that I, I mean, I was fortunate enough to be in one building for 18 years. Those of you who did your, um, your clinicals with um, groups that consult with um, different buildings, uh, have seen that they, there's a lot of um, scheduling challenges with most RDs in long-term care because they have to work in several buildings and, and they have a lot of demands on their time. Even so, I've never been in a building or in all my years of long-term care, I've really known of some, somebody that intentionally doesn't serve food in a sanitary condition in long-term care. The rules are a lot more strict in healthcare and especially long-term care than they are at restaurants 
I'm quite sure all of you have eaten at a restaurant that probably flunked a health inspection at some point or another. Um, when we were being visited by sanitarians, by the state health inspectors in long-term care, very rarely was, was there any major um, problem in long-term care kitchens, which is why uh, probably four years ago they stopped inspecting kitchens, um, which I think is a bad idea, actually. I think that it's a good idea to have a sanitarian from the state come every three months because they would come unannounced and it was always a, a good way to keep people on their toes. But they didn't find any problems, and, they, and with budget cuts that were necessary in the state, they cut that out. So, um, but even at that time, F371 was the most cited uh, tag in the country. So F371 is a huge responsibility and includes the following. Uh, accurate record keeping of trail line food temps, dish machine temps, refrigerator and freezer temps, and even those on the nursing unit. So the temperatures of all those refrigerators on all your nursing units are your responsibility as a dietitian. Now granted, if you're a consultant dietitian, you have a little less, you know, authority over those items. But for me, as the food service director in the building, it was my problem, completely my problem. Um, also, any uh, residents who have their own refrigerators in their rooms have not help us that someone would let them do that, but they do. We, you know, residents' rights, they're supposed to have a, a, a be allowed to have a refrigerator in their room. That's your responsibility too. Um, the cleanliness of all ice machines, microwaves, and refrigerators in the building. So the cleanliness of that resident who decides they want to have their chilies from three weeks ago, that's your problem too. Um, the the ice machines that can have bio growth in them, you need to be sure that you have a system for inspecting those things because that's your problem too. But it all falls under 371. So think about it, if you are a, a person who is not in the field, who is looking for a, a nursing home to put his or her loved one, and you look up and you find that, oh, the one I want to go to was cited for F371, storage, preparation, distribution, and serving food under sanitary conditions. There's no way I want my loved one to go there, but really, why did that person get it? And it doesn't say this on all of the websites. It could be because the ice machine in, um, in the long-term care unit was dirty that day when they went there. You know, it had nothing to do with how your kitchen served the food. Or, We'll get to this in a minute. The dumpster, the dumpster is yours too. The dump, you got F371 because the dumpster had leaves around it. So I got to the point that I would drive by the dumpster on my way in to park the car just to make sure there wasn't anything, um, anything around the dumpster. And then I would call maintenance and say, can you please check, can you get the leaves out away from the dumpster? So. The maintenance guy is my son-in-law now, so no wonder he was afraid of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's our> <laughs> okay, so again, the dumpsters are responsibility. It has to be clean, it has to be free from overflowing garbage, free from organic debris that might house vermin. I got cited for F-371 several years ago because it might house vermin, like a mouse or something. Um, and it has to be safe to use. So, in other words, the, um, if you've ever been around a dumpster, how many of you have ever been around a dumpster? Okay. <laughs> so, it has to be able to, um, you know, if, if it has an automatic thing, it needs to be safe, it needs to be in proper, use, proper working order and all that. And that's something that you need to check. Um, temperatures, so just another, uh, another tip on temperatures. How many of you have maybe ever been in a kitchen that the temperatures are all written by in the same ink, in the same handwriting, and it, you can tell that it was all done today for the entire month. The surveyors can tell that too. So um, part of your job would be to make sure that they're actually somebody's actually taking the temperatures every day, every meal. So it's it it can get. Especially if you 
have cooks that have been doing this for a very long time. They know their food's hot. They do. You can tell it's hot, but you still have to have the temperatures taken at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the tray line. And they should be clearly done at three different times. <laughs> not, yeah. so. Anyway, so it's, it's really important that you do that. Um, this is actually under F372, which is related to F371 at the dumpster. So does anybody have any questions about 371 or 372? Okay. When you're sitting in the exit, um, the exit, and you hear that you're getting excited for this, it really sounds like you're killing people, the way they read it. So it, it's very embarrassing to get F371, and, um, but it happens to all of us. And it could be for some little thing. The ones, I think we've only, I'm proud to say that at where I work, we only got cited for 371 twice in the 18 years I was there. And the one time was the dumpster, and one time was um, the, tra the, the tray line was over. And we had a little pan of ground meat, you know, you know the, I don't know, what is that, an eighth of a hotel pan or something, <laughs> of ground meat in the tray line, in the, in the, on the tray table. and. There were some crumbs left in it, and she she took the temperature of those crumbs, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and they weren't up to par. But no one was ever going to eat those crumbs, and so we got that whole citation about how we're not serving sanitary food. And then if, when you go through it, it will tell you whether it's widespread or it was widespread because it was on the tray line. <laughs> and I wanted, you know. It was kind of like listening to rap music. <laughs> and, but you are allowed to fight uh, citations. You're allowed to call to going to the IRD of the board. The, and you can ask that they review your site. And, um, but my administrator would not allow me to fight that. So because you're part of the team, you need to take one for the team. And if, they just, if that was just such a little thing to take, then so be it. We'll take it. And um, so, so we had to deal with that. And then they come back in 30 days. When you get cited for something, they come back in 30 days to make sure your plan of correction has been established. And if you remember, all that 371 um, comprises, they're not coming back because they don't have, I mean, they can look deeply and see, okay, well, that was because of those crumbs of ground meat. But they're not. They're going to come check the depth and breadth of 371. So that means all of those temperatures need to be done. They're coming in your kitchen. They're looking at the temps of the refrigerators. They're looking at the cleanliness of the ice machine. So you have to make sure you're on your game for all that, which you know you try to be anyway. But there's so much of a of an opportunity to fail in some other part of 371 when they have to come back in 30 days. So okay. F441, infection control. The intent of F441 is to assure that nursing homes develop, implement, and maintain infection prevention and control programs. The goal of these programs is to prevent and control the onset of infections through active surveillance and sanitary practices across all departments in the nursing home. So, what are some of the things for food service that, that we'll look at that can come under 441? Well, they will look to determine whether staff have open areas on their skin, signs of infection, or other indications of illness. So if you have any of those things and you work with food, you shouldn't be. And honestly, as, as hard as staffing is sometimes, we don't all send people home like we should when they have this condition. So if they do, you better make sure that, they are, that those things are, are covered more than once, doubly gloved or whatever, so that they don't have contact with the food, that those open areas don't have contact with the food. Also, are staff washing their hands between care of residents? Are staff touching ready-to-eat foods with their bare hands? Now, there's a lot of controversy about whether you should wear gloves and whether you shouldn't wear gloves, whether you should wash your hands instead. I will tell you that state, the state surveyors that I've come in contact with want you to be wearing gloves. They want you to change the gloves frequently. It doesn't help to wear gloves if you're in a, for example, a, a place that deals with money. What's worse than having someone wearing gloves, accepting your money, and then going and getting your salad ready with the same gloves on? No, that's not good. They're going to look for stuff like that. They, um, 
they're going to look to see in your dining rooms if the CNAs are washing their hands in between assisting residents with their meals. Um, there's no clearly defined policy regarding the use of sanitizer, but they will allow sanitizer to be used a couple of times, in my experience. So if the, if the CNA is at a table where she's assisting a few people, you know, maybe queuing a couple and helping someone else eat, as long as she, if she cuts up their food and sanitizes and then feeds somebody else, that's usually okay. But you can't sanitize for an hour. There has to be a sink in the dining room and you, the CNAs need to be getting up fairly regularly and washing their hands in between the care of residents in the dining room. Um, the other thing would be uh, on the tray line. If uh, if you're having hamburgers that day, uh, you know, is there somebody? Is is the person serving, the, getting the hamburger bun on the tray? Are they remembering to either use tongs, or are they? Do they have clean gloves on? All of that is going to be monitored very closely. The surveyor will be standing right next to someone on the tray line, which only makes your tray line even that much more nervous. Because they don't like having people. Would you? You don't like having people watching you over your shoulder either. It's very stressful. And remember, unfortunately, that the people that are in your department are probably the lowest-paid people in the building, and that's that's not good. I mean, they have a very important job, and most of them have done it for many years, and most of them really do care about what they do, um, and they are under tremendous pressure every day. But especially when there is a surveyor in the building and you have to help as a manager or help to relax them as, as much as you can. Does anybody have any questions about infection control and how that might affect your job as a dietitian? Some other things besides meal service, you know, uh, urinary tract infections are closely monitored um, by, usually each home has a, uh, an infection control nurse that they contract with and that person will come in and monitor all kinds of infections like UTIs, uh, GI infections, and things like that. So you as a dietitian may be involved in some kind of citation if there's a high number of urinary tract infections in your building. So you need to know as a dietitian, do you have something in place? Are you serving water on every tray? Uh, are you, if there's somebody who's had frequent UTIs, are you aware of that? Are you offering them maybe cranberry juice or some of one of the cranberry supplements that are available now? They want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to help keep the rates of UTIs low. Um, if there's a high rate of GI infection on one unit or even throughout the building, they may ask you, did you realize that? Do you think it had anything to do with what food was served that night uh, or the day before? So you need to have an answer like, oh yes, I, we did talk about the fact that there were a lot of people sick on sick that day, and this is what was served, and here are my temperature logs. So all of that, you know, your call it can be called into question too. Okay, F two forty one dignity. Um, again, this isn't specifically saying anything about nutrition, but the way you serve your residents affects their ability to maintain their dignity. So. Are you providing meals to all residents at the table at the same time? <coughs> providing napkins and non-disposable cutlery and dishware, including cups and glasses. Most places want to see you using uh, linen napkins. Uh, consider residents' desires when using clothing protectors, and we don't use the term bib, even if the residents want to use that. They may say, can you get me a bib? You say, here's your clothing protector. Um, so it's really important that when you're, that the, you maintain the dignity of all your residents at the meal service. And one, the, the big thing that they will look at as they're observing dining is, is everyone at the table getting an issue and hard to, you, you think it would be easy to serve everyone at the same time, but it isn't always easy. You have to make sure that your meals are coming out in the right order. You have to get with nursing staff constantly to be sure that this person is still getting up for meals, still coming to this dining room for meals, and not in not in bed that night, that day at lunch. There has to be constant communication because if something happens and maybe somebody's in the dining room that hasn't been there in a week, 
and so you serve them their tray, but nobody else at the table has their tray. You can't do that. And they all have to make sure, you have to make sure everybody gets their meal so that their food temperatures are appropriate. So it, it, it's really, really hard. You'd think it would be easy for everyone to get their meal at the same time, but it takes a lot of planning. And also the people who pass the trays, whether that be the CNAs, and usually it is the CNAs, most buildings don't have enough dietary staff to have dietary pass the trays. It would be much easier on us as dietitians if we had our own staff passing the trays, but that usually isn't the case. So the CNAs, while they change quite a bit, or maybe you know somebody came from night shift who never passes the tray, and all of a sudden they're there in the middle of lunch passing trays when they've never done it before, um, and surveys in the building, so the surveyors watching. You know, you need to make sure that you're available um, to help smooth over the, the meal pass process and make sure everybody gets their meal at the same time. If that means you standing at the the cart where the trays are, because you know all the residents and you know the, a couple of CNAs don't, and you hand them the tray so that they know where to go so that everybody gets the tray at the same time. And of course, on a, you should probably be doing that once a week anyway. We shouldn't be waiting for survey to come in the building to do that. We should be making sure that those lists and the way the meals come out are accurate every day at every meal. And that's easier said than done with all of the work that, that you have to do. But again, the napkins and non-disposable cutlery and dishware, um, invariably when state walks in the building, the dish machine goes down. It's just kind of Murphy's Law. And so you're faced with uh, getting that dish machine fixed so it's at the right temperature versus serving um, on paper, which you really don't want to do because then you're going to get this site. So either you get the site for not having the right temperature, which is worse, the day, I guess. I don't know. Sometimes it's really hard to decide. Sometimes you're washing dishes by hand, just to, so you don't have to deal with that. Um, you want to wait for residents at a table to finish their meal before scraping food off of plates. You never want to really do that at the table. It's not like, you know, Aunt Bessie at home on Thanksgiving doing that. You don't really want to do that when people are at the table. Um, sitting next to the residents while assisting them to eat rather than standing. It's really important the CNAs sit down with them and when they're, you know, they're not just saying, hey, how was your weekend? As they're standing, as they're talking to their friends across the room and they're kind of shoveling the food in. That, that's not a dignified way to assist someone with eating. And uh, talk with residents for whom they're providing assistance rather than conducting social conversations with other staff who are assisting residents. So, that's a really tempting thing to do for, for CNAs and those who are uh, feeding and, uh, or assisting with feeding, so that needs to be stopped. Um, residents need time, the time that they need to complete eating their meal, so they have to have ample time to eat. Speak with residents politely and respectfully and communicate personal information in a way that maintains confidentiality. Um, so in other words, you wouldn't be shouting, I need that diabetic tray for Miss Smith. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't work well. Um, respond to residents' requests in a timely manner. So if somebody doesn't like what they got, you really need to try to get it for them while everybody else at the table is eating. And remove beverages from containers. It's really important that um, we don't expect an 85-year-old woman to open her own milk carton. It's really better to have those things pre-poured if at all possible. Um, the, um, the other thing that's important would be adaptive devices and positioning at a table. If somebody requires adaptive feeding devices, they need to have those available for them when the meal is served. So they shouldn't be sitting there waiting to get their special fork or plate or something like that. Also, they... Uh, Does anybody have any questions about dignity? I'll think of it again in a minute. Okay, home-like environment. Um, another tag that may affect you as a dietitian in long-term care. Meals served on trays in the dining room would not be a home-like environment. So it's important that you remove the food from the tray 
Medication administration practices that interfere with the quality of the dining experience. So in other words, the nurse shouldn't be rolling in the med cart and passing out meds during meals. That wouldn't be a home-like environment. At home, you don't have your, your, you know, a big, huge med cart in your dining room or in your kitchen. Now, they could take, it, it, it's really difficult, and I'm not sure what all the rules regarding med paths are, because that's a nursing issue. They, the nurse can walk in with a little, uh, if, there's, if, there are, if there are meds that have to be taken with food or with their meals, the nurse can walk in with a little med cup and just stand and say, hey, how are you doing today? And give them the med cup and make sure that they take their medicine. That is part of what they have to do. So they can't give them the med, the cup with their meds in it and tell them and send them on their way to the dining room because the nurse is required to watch them take their medicine. So they can walk in with a med cup if it has to be done at med time and, and have a polite conversation. But the med cart shouldn't be moved in there and they shouldn't be lining up getting their meds in the dining room. Okay, that's the basic thing for that. Um, the, other, the other thing that could come into play with dignity and the home-like environment would be patients or residents who eat in their rooms. Those of you in acute care know that's what they do, but in long-term care, they really should be encouraged to come out of their room, if at all possible. And if they refuse, that's their right. So we have resident rights we have to consider, too. But we should try to have them come in the dining room and socialize, and rather than eat, because then if they're eating off a tray in their room, that's not a home-like environment, and it's not dignified. So you have to make sure that you've charted that this is so-and-so, um, requests eating in her room and doesn't mind eating from her tray and things like that have to all be charted. Because then, when the, when the surveyors see somebody eating in their room, they're going to ask them, why are you eating in your room? Hopefully they'll say, because this is what I prefer to do. And not because, you know, because then, then they're going to go to the chart and see that if you, if you charted that. And then they're going to ask the resident council too, when they have a resident council meeting, they're going to say, how many of you like to eat in your room? And all of that needs to, needs to jive, <coughs> otherwise you'll get cited. Okay, F242, self-determination and participation. So they do have choices on where to eat, like I said, but they do need to be documented. Um, they have a the choice to refuse a meal, but again, you need to document. Why are they refusing the meal? Is it because they hate the food? Is it because they want to die? You know? Um, they have the, the right to refuse the meal, uh, to refuse the meal, but you need to document why they're refusing it. Have you done everything you can to get them something that they like to eat if they say they hate the food? Um, has there been a social services and a site consult if somebody wants to die? Um, and that's okay too, you know, they don't have to eat, and we don't have to give them a tube feeding if they refuse to have one, but all of those, um, services, all of those um, site services need to be, have been provided and in place, and the person needs to determine that they can make their own decisions. So if somebody has dementia and they're not eating, they can't decide they want to die. They have dementia. The family's going to have to be involved in that decision, and hopefully the family has talked to the resident when they were of sound mind, so they have an idea of what kind of end of life they would like. That's a whole other issue. Are substitutes offered? So when they're when, when surveyors are observing uh, meal paths or the meal, the dining experience, I should say the dining experience. What and someone they won't eat anything? Did, were they offered a substitute? Were they offered an alternate choice? If they weren't offered it and they just said, oh, you just didn't make them hungry today, and you just took it away and didn't offer them a choice, then that's a problem. Um, did the resident choose when to eat? This is a very difficult and new plant on this um, F242 tag. Uh, there are new, it's called uh, the Pioneer Network, has some new information out on how to choose the dining times. There are a lot of places that are switching to a restaurant type service so that people can walk in at any time and eat. Um, it does make it difficult staffing wise and between nursing staff and dietary staff they're trying to to work out new ways to serve people in a restaurant type environment in long term care. It's hard. It's really hard to do. Um, 
Have any of you had any experience, those of you who were in buildings that have switched to the Pioneer Network kind of thing and are offering choices of time? That is the new thing, and that's what they're going to be looking at, to make sure that the resident um, isn't forced to get out of bed at 7 in the morning to eat breakfast. That if they don't want to get up at 7, that they can come in at 9 and have breakfast. It's really, really hard to, um, to manage that, but it's where we need to go. And where food preference is honored. It's really important that we get food preferences on admission and regularly throughout their stay and that we document those food preferences and that we provide those food preferences. That can include allergies too, although that's a little more serious. Um, you know, if you give somebody eggs and they don't happen to like eggs, it's annoying, but it's not deadly. If you give somebody peanut butter who's allergic to peanuts, that could be deadly. So all of those things are monitored and need to be um, highlighted for the tray line personnel or whoever's serving the meal to know that. Okay, any questions about self-determination or participation? Okay, F312, provision of assistance, assistive devices, and positioning. So, when somebody is eating, and this is what I wanted to, this is what I forgot to talk about, so I knew it was coming up at some point. Uh, the provision of cueing, prompting, or assisting for residents who need it. How assistance is provided to residents who eat in their room. How staff identify and provide any special dietary requirements or adaptation of utensils. And staff availability during the dining process. So, for example, somebody who needs help eating, maybe they can, they can um, feed themselves, but they just need to have assistive devices. Is there, a, a, is there a, a system in place that you can get the appropriate evaluation done? It's really not up to you as a dietitian to decide if somebody needs a weighted spoon or a plate guard or something like that. But it's up to you to notice that they maybe have difficulty feeding themselves and to make a referral to occupational therapy to make those um, devices available. So those, those things need to be, if somebody is having trouble feeding themselves and nobody's assisting, the surveyor will look to see why, or was there um, a referral made to OT? Uh, is the person supposed to have adaptive devices and they just didn't get them? Also, someone who, insists on eating in their room but maybe has dysphagia. What kind of assistance and monitoring is provided to that person who wants to eat, uh, eat by themselves but really isn't safe to? That's another quandary that we face. Um, we talked about identifying and providing special dietary requirements or adaptation of utensils and uh, but also positioning at the table and in their chair. Is somebody, does somebody need a special wheelchair or special positioning devices in their chair in order for them to be able to sit up properly at the table and eat? Or are they in a, are they in a jerry chair rolled up to the table and they're way back here, they're reclined away from the table and they can't feed themselves? That, does, that doesn't help them maintain their dignity either. Um, so positioning in their chair, positioning at the table, and, you know, then, so not only am I hearing rap music when I'm in the nursing home and you're taking care of me, but you have wheeled me up to a table. By then, I'm, I don't know, 4'9", because I've shrunk, right? I'm already only 5 feet. So I'm 4'9", and I'm sitting at a table, and the table's up here on me. And I'm trying to feed myself. That doesn't work either. So all that kind of stuff. Are they at the right table height for their height? Are they positioned in the chair appropriately? All of that is being looked at and scrutinized very carefully. And you should have done it already, too. Okay. The assistive devices we talked about for proper positioning to maximize eating. Do the wheelchairs fit under the tables, or are they way up here? You know, is, is my wheelchair flush with the table so that my food is way in front of me, but I'm sitting back and I can't reach it? And the assistance provi assistant provided to the residents dependent on staff. Okay. F364, food quality, mechanically altered diets such as puree were prepared and served as separate items. So in other words, you didn't look at a puree tray and see all the food kind of melding into each other. Um, food placement, colors and textures were in keeping with the resident's needs and resident interviews regarding the food, especially those on mechanically altered diets, were 
satisfactory. They will ask residents, either resident council or in their personal interviews with, with certain residents that they've picked, they'll ask them. I'll tell you where I worked, uh, out of 180 patients, we had about 80 people on mechanically altered diet. So a very, very high percentage of people who were on pureed or ground meat or something like that. And the food still needs to be garnished. It still needs to look like food. Um, there are a lot of, you can buy preformed food that is a pureed pork chop, but it looks like a pork chop. A lot of places don't use them because they're very expensive and they don't fit into your budget. So if you don't use them, does it still look pleasing enough, even if it's just a, a pureed, like, blob? Is it a nice blob? <laughs> <laughs> and are you serving, you know, does your pureed tray that day, I mean, are you serving uh, pureed chicken, mashed potatoes, and corn? That doesn't look so hot. I mean, that's not very aesthetically pleasing. It's not something that you would want to eat normally or put as a combination together. So all of that is important to consider when you're approving menus. As a dietitian, even if you don't write the menus, you have to approve them. So when you look at the pureed and mechanically altered diets, is that, are you picturing what that plate looks like before you sign off on it? Okay. Test tray procedures. They will most, surveyors will most often do a test tray. Sometimes they don't. If they really walk in and everything's at the right temperature on their cursory visit, their initial visit, that's just really quick um, when they first walk in the building. Is, is everything, are the temperatures good? Do the residents seem happy in the dining room? They may not do a test tray. But 99% of the time they will do a test tray. And what they will do is They'll request a test tray, they'll, they'll tell you what floor you or what unit they want it to come on, and it needs to be the last tray off the cart. So after <coughs> everyone is served, that's when the uh, surveyor will take the tray off the cart and take temperatures on the unit. And so that means if you're having trouble with your meal pass, your dining services on that unit that day, and they don't get to that last tray for an hour, the temperatures are not going to be appropriate by the time the surveyor takes it because she's not going to take it until everyone else got their tray. So the hot food needs to be hot at that point, the cold food needs to be cold at that point. And again, it's usually the unit that's the greatest distance from the kitchen, and the food, they're going to check the food temperature and palatability of the test meal close to the time the last resident on the unit begins to eat. So any questions about 364? Okay, 366, food substitution. Did staff attempt to determine the reason for the refusal and offer a substitute item of equal nutritive value or no food item of the resident's choice? If there is no alternate item offered, ask the resident if it happens frequently, this is what surveyors will do, and determine what is available for substitutes. So for a lot of reasons, of course, you want the person to have what they need and you want to make sure a substitute is offered, but you also have to have a good personal relationship with your residents too. Because, you know, they don't maybe have a lot of people visiting them. And so if a surveyor is paying attention to them, and, and they, it may be the first time in a year that they didn't get what they wanted. And but the resident says, oh, does that happen often? Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. And so you have another can of worms opened up. And, you know, but maybe if, they, if you have a good relationship with them, they'll remember, they'll catch your eye, and they'll say no. It doesn't happen often. But often they will just say yes, yeah. just like you know, just like anybody who wants to have someone talk to them for a few extra minutes. You know, you can't blame them. Okay, designated dining and activity rooms, um, 464. F464. Does the facility provide one or more dining rooms? So they're gonna want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to eat in a dining room if they do, if they can. Adequate and comfortable lighting, stuff like this you don't think, you know, but remember back to when you made your kitchen with Dr. D. All of this was important to consider. Are illumination levels task appropriate with little glare? That's all for your employees, but also for the residents in the dining room. Does the lighting support independent functioning? So are all the lights in good repair? Is it light enough that people can feed themselves? Is it light enough that your staff can work properly and see what they're doing? Along with that F257, comfortable and safe temperature levels. Is there good air 
air circulation in the in the both in the kitchen where your employees are working and in the dining rooms where your residents are eating. Acceptable temperature and humidity, avoidance of drafts at the floor level, adequate removal of smoke, exhaust, and odors. So for all of your um, dietary personnel who won't turn the fan on, and you every time you walk in the kitchen you turn the fan on, that's why. You're, you're required to remove the smoke, exhaust, and odors. And as much as they hate having that on, um, you need to turn it on. Um, comfortable and safe temperature levels again. Do residents complain about heat or cold in the dining areas? What does staff do if residents complain? Uh, measure the temperature of the room. It should be 71 to 81 degrees Fahrenheit at a, at a minimum. But if the residents complain that 71 is too cold, then you need to be doing something about increasing the temperature in the dining room. It's not supposed to be comfortable for you. It's supposed to be comfortable for them because it's their home. And even though you're running around and you're pretty hot, you can't change the temperature to what's uncomfortable, something that's uncomfortable for the residents. Sound levels, my favorite. <laughs> uh, do residents need, or staff need to raise their voice to be heard? Can residents be heard over the background noises? And do residents have control over unwanted noises? So if you're playing um, music in the dining room, is it appropriate to what they want to hear. That is really important. Um, is there, is maintenance working on some banging in the kitchen while you're serving the meal and it's affecting them? They need to stop. Um, and it's important that you don't yell or scream to get someone's attention. Okay, then we have F362 and 368, staffing of dietary services and frequency of meals. Is there enough staff to prepare and serve meals and schedule? And also in that F362, it discusses the need for um, dietary managers and their qualifications and who needs to be in the building when meals are being served. So it is important that you have a qualified individual in charge at every meal, even when you're not in the building or even when the CDM is in the building. Whoever's in charge needs to be qualified to be there. The evening meal and breakfast should have no greater time lapse than 14 hours. This is a tough one. 16 hours with the approval of resident council and a substantial bedtime snack. So you can uh, make it 16 hours. Now, how many of you know, I know my parents would prefer to eat dinner at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and breakfast the next day at 4, you know, that afternoon. Just so they're ahead of the game. But... <laughs> And that's how a lot of our residents are, but we're not, you know, we can't do that. If we have 180 people to feed, then it's a lot, unless we start feeding breakfast at six in the morning, which nobody wants to get up that early, um, someone is bound to eat breakfast at 8.30 or so. And so that means dinner needs to be at six or 6.30. And that's really late for a lot of these little people. They don't want to eat that late. And so you have to get with resident council and come up with a documented solution to that if they want to eat earlier. That's fine. You can do that. But it needs to be documented and you need to provide a substantial 8 o'clock snack. So that means it needs to have some protein in it. It needs to be like a half sandwich or cheese stick or peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something like that that has some protein in it. No one's going to eat it. You're going to provide it and no one's going to eat it. But you still have to provide it. So they're all going to be in bed at 8 o'clock. When you when you serve it, but okay, that's it for the for our PowerPoint. We're gonna take a break in a minute, and then we'll work on our case studies. But does anybody have any questions about the various tags that you could be responsible for in long-term care? Okay. Well, let's